Hello everybody, Joel here uh, from As It Is Written. Sorry it's been a while, I um, have had a busy month and got sick all last week, so I haven't been able to record a video in a while. Uh, but here I am again, I'm going to be talking with y'all about something that has come up in conversations uh, in regards to a passage in Acts chapter 7. So looking here, I'm going to read here at the end of Acts chapter 7, starting in verse 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. Now these are the people that Stephen... Uh, the disciple was speaking to, and he was rebuking them for their hardness of heart. It says, But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God, and said, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with the sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now the claim that I have heard with this passage is focusing in on when Stephen says, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Now, if you recall, in many passages, uh, that, well, it's one passage from the Psalms, but it's repeated multiple times. It says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until all your enemies are made a footstool. And when Jesus ascended into heaven, it was said that he took his seat at the right hand of God. So, in all the passages that we see, Jesus is usually seen sitting on the throne. But in this passage, he is standing. Now, there are a few claims that are made as to what this means for Jesus to be standing. One claim is that by standing at the right hand of God, Jesus is proudly standing for Stephen as if he's giving him a standing ovation for the work that he's done. And for the message that he did, that essentially he was being a good and faithful servant, so Jesus stood up to honor him. <clears throat> Another explanation would be that Jesus stood up because he was ready to come back, his second coming, the second advent of Christ, if the people of Israel accepted him. But when he saw that they rejected him and the message that Stephen preached to them, essentially the argument is that Jesus shut the gates of heaven, sat back down on his throne, and he's going to deal with them sometime in the future. This is the typical kind of thing that comes out of dispensational theology. Now, I am not a dispensationalist um, believer. Uh, that's not how I interpret the scriptures at all. Uh, I think that there are many errors and issues with the dispensational view. That's not exactly what I want to focus on primarily in today's video, but I, I will likely do a video like that in the future. But uh, I just think that the dispensationalist approach to texts like this is way off base. Before we dive in to um, the arguments and why I think that they are wrong views that the dispensationalists have on this verse, I did want to uh, go ahead and say that if you are new to my videos, um, I, I would just ask that if you please consider liking and subscribing to my channel. Uh, it helps me with YouTube and getting my videos out before more people. And uh, if you're interested, we do have a Facebook page. If you would like to follow us there, it's facebook.com slash as it is written lessons. Uh, with that being said, let's dive on in. So again, let's go back to the first argument that essentially Jesus, the reason he is standing instead of sitting is because he is Honoring Stephen at his um, bravery, I guess, is the argument. And he is giving him a standing ovation as he's about to receive his spirit. <clears throat> this doesn't work for me, and I'll tell you why. In Luke chapter 17, 
starting in verse 5. It says, And the apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. So the Lord said, If you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, Be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. And which of you, having a servant plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in from the field, Come at once and sit down. But will he not rather say to him, Prepare something for my supper, and gird yourself and serve me, till I have eaten and drunk, and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. Now, why would Jesus say this in Luke chapter 17? And bear in mind that Luke and Acts are written by the same author, Luke. Luke gives us this story in chapter 17 of Luke, saying that the one who comes in, the servant who comes in from his work, instead of the master commending him for the work that he did, Jesus says, I think not. He's not going to do that because it's his duty to do. You don't thank someone for doing what they were commanded to do. Um, he, he even concludes there with, so likewise, when you, so turning it back to the apostles, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. They're just fulfilling the command given to them. There's nothing special. There's no need for a standing ovation. In fact, all the praise and glory, instead of putting that on man, why are we not putting it on Christ? See, the one who says that Stephen received a standing ovation is, is taking on a man-centered way of looking at the text. But, through and through the Bible is Christ-centered. So, if we take Jesus' words here, we are essentially saying, this was my duty to do because, Jesus, you are the one that has truly done all the work. We are unprofitable servants. We have only done what you commanded us to do. There's no need to receive a standing ovation for that. <clears throat> With that being said, the other argument is that uh, when Jesus was standing at the right hand of the throne, and Stephen is seeing him in a vision, that this is Jesus saying, I'm ready to come back, my second coming. Now, what's a little weird about this view, and I'm not saying it's wrong just because of this, but it's a little strange that Jesus ascended into heaven just three, three and a half years prior to the stoning of Stephen, and he's already ready to come back? I mean, I, I, I don't know that at this time, the apostles had gone to all the places Jesus instructed them to go, but he's ready to come back? That just doesn't seem plausible to me. But, here's the thing. The dispensationalists like to say that Jesus was ready to come back and set up his millennial kingdom. But the reason that he didn't is because at Stephen's um, message here, the Jews rejected him. So what their argument essentially is, is that upon seeing their rejection of him, he sat back down on his throne, the gates of heaven were closed, and instead of coming back, he went with plan B. He was going to send the gospel to the Gentiles and start the church, to which in dispensational theology, you have to always separate Israel and the church which is kind of a bit of a problem when you start talking about Jewish Christians. Um, but I don't want to get too much into eschatology right now. I'm just making some points. Did Jesus sit back down because God did not anticipate this to happen? Did Jesus sit back down because, well, the Jews didn't accept me, but they were supposed to, so I'm going to go with plan B. I'm going to take the gospel to the Gentiles. Is that what happened? I will argue no. And I have many scriptures to go over with you in regards to that. <clears throat> the idea that this was unforeseen 
or not the expected result is silly and absurd. Because, as Peter would say in 1 Peter 1, 19-20, But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, he, was indeed, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in these last times for you. Now, this doesn't directly connect to what we're talking about in Acts chapter 7, but I did want to mention it because <clears throat> even the slain of the Lamb of God was in view before the foundation of the earth. That is, before the earth was created, before Adam and Eve took of the fruit and sinned in the garden, God had already planned to send Jesus. The plan was always in effect. <clears throat> to get back onto what we're talking about here, with the gospel going to the Gentiles and Israel rejecting their Messiah, was that unknown to God? Absolutely not. It was talked about all through the Bible. <clears throat> if we go to Galatians 3, verses 6 through 9, as Paul is talking about Abraham, <clears throat> he said, Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you, all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. We see again here, the scriptures foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. The Gentiles were not a plan B option. They were always part of the promise to Abraham that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through his seed. Now dropping down in Galatians 3 a little further, <clears throat> we see in verse 15, Paul continues, Brethren, I speak in the manner of men, though it is only a man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. And this I say that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So, again, we're seeing here that the promise was made to Abraham and his seed. Paul explains that seed is singular. It's speaking of Christ Jesus. And so that the promise was made to Abraham now, this is long time, 430 years before the law came around, and then many, many more years before Christ comes, and then the Israelites reject their Messiah, we're already seeing that the promise was to Abraham and his seed, who is Christ, and that the, uh, the inheritance, the blessing, the promises of the covenant are received by those who believe through faith. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 18 to continue building our case for why this is very bad theology. <clears throat> In Deuteronomy 18:15, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear, according to all you desired of the Lord your God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, What they have spoken is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. That is Jesus he's speaking of, the prophet that was prophesied by Moses that would come up after him from the midst of their brethren was Jesus. And God is saying, I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And then verse 19, and it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. <clears throat> Aha. Now we're seeing a piece of the puzzle. So all through this, we are seeing something. God has spoken of this reality from pretty much the very beginning. 
He spoke of the necessity of Christ to die for the forgiveness of sins and the restoration of the creation. He spoke of the Israelites' rebellion. He spoke of a prophet coming up, being Christ himself, who would speak God's words to them, and that whoever will not hear his words, it will be required of him. <clears throat> so let's jump over real quick <clears throat> to John, excuse me, John chapter 12. <clears throat> Now, starting in verse 42 of John 12, Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should, put, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Then Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world, that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. <clears throat> now, this is identical to what we just read in Deuteronomy 18. In Deuteronomy 18, it says, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Jesus mirroring those words in John 12 says that he himself is not going to judge them. The thing by which they are going to be judged or his words. And Jesus is saying, just like in Deuteronomy 18, that the words he's speaking were given to him by the Father to speak. So he is relaying the message to them, and those who are not receiving it, that is, believing by faith, they have that which judges them. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. That is what is meant by the phrase that is, mentioned in Deuteronomy 18, that whoever will not hear his words, I will require it of him. <clears throat> now, we're moving somewhere here. We're seeing some language now that has nothing to do with standing ovations or God changing the script and, and going with plan B. We are seeing the fulfillment of what God promised to Israel should they break his commandment and turn away from his ways. In fact, if you... I, I, I'm not including this in the video because it's such a long chapter, but go through Deuteronomy 28 and you see all the blessings that would come for Israel if they believed God and kept his commands. <clears throat> but about halfway through, you get to the contrast. But if you break my commands and break my covenant, these are the curses that I will apply to you. <clears throat> go and read it. Because it's significant to this whole conversation. It's significant to what we're looking at here in Acts 7, um, <clears throat> with Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. And it's significant to eschatology, all sorts of things that help us to better understand the scriptures. We have to view scriptures together. Now let's go to Deuteronomy 31, starting in verse 16. <clears throat> and the Lord said to Moses, Behold, you will rest with your fathers. And this people will rise and play the harlot with the gods of the foreigners of the land, where they go to be among them. And they will forsake me and break my covenant, which I have made with them. <clears throat> then my anger shall be aroused against them in that day, and I will forsake them. And I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured. And many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, Have not these evils come upon us because our God is not among us? 
And I will surely hide my face in that day because of all the evil which they have done, in that they have turned to other gods. Now therefore write down this song for yourselves and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths that the song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. When I have brought them to the land flowing with milk and honey, of which I swore to their fathers, and they have eaten and filled themselves and grown fat, then they will turn to other gods and serve them. And they will provoke me and break my covenant. Then it shall be, when many evils and troubles have come upon them, that this song will testify against them as a witness, for it will not be forgotten in the mouths of their descendants, for I know the inclination of their behavior today, even before I have brought them to the land of which I swore to give them. So God knew this beforehand. He knew that Israel was going to turn away, they, they were going to get well fed, fill their bellies, and turn away from him and play the harlot by serving other gods. And and God was promising that he was going to strike them as a result. And that's exactly what he did. In fact, the uh, Babylonian invasion that would later happen was explained as God's hand at work against Israel to strike them for their disobedience. And actually, we see this all throughout the Old Testament uh, of, you know, read the book of Judges. And you'll see the phrase repeated, um, and the children of Israel did what was evil in the sight of God again. They continued to do it and rebel and turn against God and break his covenant. Okay, So with all this in mind, what we are seeing is none of this surprised God. He was well aware of it before it even happened. And so when we go back here to Acts chapter 7, and we see Jesus, or the Son of Man, standing at the right hand of God. There's absolutely no reason to think that this is applause for Stephen, or a plan B is about to start happening because of Israel's rejection. God was not caught off guard. Jesus said, the servant doesn't deserve um, to be thanked for what he was commanded to do. So what is going on here? We've seen little hints in some of the other passages we read that it was hinted at even in Deuteronomy um, that God was planning to strike them, that because they didn't receive his words, that it was going to be required of them. Again, in John, they were going to be judged based on his words and not receiving it. So what we need to do now is we need to look at what is going on in this time uh, where Stephen is is getting stoned. The people are killing him. They're lashing out at his words. Well, Stephen has made a pretty long case. Um, This chapter is is pretty pretty long. Uh, You can go and read it for yourself if you want to. Uh, I recommend it because he starts with the call of Abraham. Abraham being in the land that would later be called Babylon, uh, Ur of the Chaldeans in Mesopotamia, uh, before he dwelt in the land of Haran. And God called him out and even told uh, Abraham that his children would be in bondage in Egypt for 400 years. And then he goes into the story about Joseph uh, and, and the captivity in Egypt. Uh, you know, the, the whole lineage all the way through Moses, right? So he, he talks about how Moses was sent to deliver the children of, uh, of Israel from the Egyptian captivity. Um, <clears throat> here we go. Verse 35, this Moses, whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? is the one God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. Now, that phrase right there about them questioning Moses, who made you a ruler and a judge? They didn't want Moses to be a ruler and a judge over them, uh, which sounds very familiar to something that happened to Jesus. Here we are in Luke 19 now, starting in verse 11. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing, actually. It's the parable of the minus, if you want to go and read about that. You know, essentially, um, the three servants are given some minus, and two of them invest and get a return, and they return it to the the master and the one. 
uh, buries it into a handkerchief and says, ah, here's a, you know, what, what you gave me, I gave it back. Well, the other two are committed, well done, good, good servant, because you were faithful and very little, have authority over ten cities. Um, and the second came saying, Master, your mana has earned five minas. Likewise, he said to him, you also be over five cities. Then the other who hid it in the handkerchief, he did it because of fear. And the master said to him, out of your own mouth, I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank that at my coming, I might have collected it with interest? Okay. Now here's where it gets interesting. At the end of this parable, he says, and he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him and give it to him who has 10 minus. But they said to him, master, he has 10 minus. For I say to you that to everyone who has will be given. And from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. But bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. Okay, so. We have to go back to the beginning of the parable because I didn't read the whole thing. But it says, as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Therefore, he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called 10 of his servants, delivered to them 10 minus and said to them, do business till I come. But his citizens hated him. And sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. Now that sounds pretty similar to what we read in Acts 7 about Moses. They did not want him to be a ruler and a judge over them. Likewise, the citizens, uh, which, which would represent the Israelites, Jesus came to them and they would not have him reign over them. So continuing on in Acts 7, um, <clears throat> Stephen quotes what we talked about earlier. This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall fear. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai, and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us, whom our fathers would not obey, but rejected. And in their hearts, they turned back to Egypt. And now he's going to go on to describe how when Moses went up on the mountain to get the commands from God, they quickly turned their hearts away from God and went to Aaron, begging them, begging Aaron to make them a golden calf that they would bow down and worship. And ironically, though it was a false idol, they called it Yahweh, which was blasphemy. Then God turned and gave them up to the worship of the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. Did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You also took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Remphan. Images which you made to worship, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. All right, <clears throat> so this is starting to pile on itself, and I know I am reading a lot of scripture. I want you to try to follow as best as you can because this is very important. He is relating their idolatry in the wilderness, the golden calf, and how they would turn their hearts away, and he would carry them away beyond Babylon. That's what we were reading earlier in Deuteronomy 18 and Deuteronomy 31. And um, basically the promise he gave them in Deuteronomy 28 that I told you to go and read, um, that if they broke his covenant, he would bring upon them curses. All right. And, and Stephen is using this picture of the rebellion against God and God striking them by the hand of Babylon as a picture to point to the, the current state that Stephen was in with the Israelites of his day. <clears throat> he, 
He goes on to say, Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen, which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David, who found favor before God and asked to find a dwelling for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. So if you don't recall, this is where David desired to build a house for the Lord, but he had too much blood on his hands. So the task of building the temple went to Solomon, his son. However, Stephen says, continuing, The Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. As the prophet says, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? See, there was never going to be a house, a a man-made house that God was going to dwell in and, and, and be contained by men. In fact, what we see in the New Covenant and in, in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is our bodies become the temple of the Holy Spirit, God dwelling with us. And that is something that God made. We, didn't, we are not responsible for building our bodies. This body was built by God. It was made by God. And collectively, as believers in Jesus, we are being built up into the true temple, the church, we are considered living stones, as Peter would say. So, this is toward the end of his speech now. Stephen says, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. See, again, with what he has been going through. And he's talking about the rebellion of the Israelites under Moses, the worshiping of the golden calf, the God promised he would drive them out in the Babylon. And now Stephen's drawing everything together. You you revere this temple. Now, why is he talking about the temple? Go back one chapter to chapter six, and they are scrutinizing Stephen because he said these things are coming to an end, talking of the temple and the Old Covenant. Now, that's true. The temple, Jesus prophesied about multiple times in his ministry that he was going to destroy it. Now, these people did not like that. They liked their temple. They thought that God could be contained in their temple. But Stephen said it's going to be destroyed. And he is showing them that you are stiff-necked, uncircumcised in heart and ears. They're resisting the Holy Spirit because they are stuck in, in desiring this material, physical thing that they can control and, and place hands on. And Stephen's here saying, no, 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 all this is about to be destroyed. So he says, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? Now, he's saying these things because the very things that their fathers, the ones who killed the prophets, like Jesus said in his lament of Jerusalem, 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 the one who slays the prophets, the blood from Abel um, to, I think, Zechariah, sorry, I'm blanking right now, but the, the blood of all those prophets slain would be on their heads of that generation. And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. So these same people in Stephen's days were doing exactly what their fathers, their ancestors did to the prophets of their own day. They were rejecting the word of the Lord. And what did Jesus say? The thing that was going to judge them in in John 12? He said, my words, which he also explains, as it said in Deuteronomy 18 and John 12, the connection is the words Jesus was speaking came from the Father. They came from God on high. And through the mouth of Jesus in the flesh, who was telling them, if you don't receive my words, you have that which will judge you. My words that I have spoken to you. Now, This is building up iniquity in Israel, 
which is going to fill uh, or or draw God to more and more jealousy for these people who are rejecting and rebelling against him. So when they heard these things that Stephen was saying, they were cut to the heart. Now, we already saw this happen when Peter preached his sermon in Acts chapter 2. Except the people there repented. Peter, what what should we do? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the remission of sins. He, he was actually able to convert these people because they repented. But in Stephen's case, these people hardened their hearts. Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven, saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Okay? Here we are again. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Now, if this was a positive message, why would their response be to cry out with a loud voice, stop their ears, and run at him with one accord to cast him out of the city and stone him to death? If this was a positive image, why would they do that? That's because this has nothing, again, to do with a standing ovation or God's plan not working out the way he wanted it to. This was actually prophesied about. We, we see that all the events leading up here, uh, going back to Acts chapter 2 when, when Pentecost happened, Peter drew off Pentecost what was happening with the, the people speaking in tongues and, and the people listening on thought that they were drunk in the middle of the morning. And, and he said, no, this is what was written about in the prophet Joel. So let's go there in, in Joel 2, 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I will show wonders in, in the heavens and in the earth. So now, before I continue the rest of this, they saw signs and wonders. They were seen. In fact, it said in Acts chapter 6 that when they looked at Stephen, his face was shining bright. He had the appearance of the face of an angel. They had signs and wonders and all these testifying things to show them what was going on was from God. And yet, they still hardened their hearts. And, and so, continuing in Joel chapter 2, this is what would happen as a result of the rejection of the Spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Guess who quoted that verse right there? One of the people present at the stoning of Stephen, the Apostle Paul, who would become the Apostle to the Gentiles, quotes this in Acts chapter 10, that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You think that's a coincidence? I don't. I think that this is all during the time that this prophecy is coming to fulfillment. And... Continuing to finish out here in Joel chapter 2, it says, For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance. And he explains, As the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. And we don't have time to get into it right now, but if you go through Paul's letter to the Romans, he talks about the remnant, that all Israel would be saved. And he says, is it as though God's word has failed? No. Absolutely not. God's word f succeeded in that not only did it draw in the remnant of Israel, but the gospel went out to the Gentiles as well. Because again, l let's keep everything tracking together. Go back to Galatians chapter 3. He's talking about the promises given to Abraham and his seed, and through Christ, who is the seed, shall 
all the nations of the earth be blessed. That includes Jew and Gentile alike. Now, this standing, to, to start wrapping this all up, this standing that we see Jesus doing in Acts chapter 7, he is standing, yes, because Israel rejected, but not because he's instituting plan B. The original plan is in effect. The gospel's going out to the Gentiles. They are going to see by God's holy and righteous judgment. They are going to see that God is true and every man a liar. That when God's judgments are in the earth, the people learn righteousness. And through this judgment and this hardening in, uh, of Israel at the time, the gospel went through Paul to the Gentiles and brought them into the promise that was part of the plan from the beginning. This is all what was going on. But what's happening here with Jesus standing at the right hand of the throne, when he was sitting, he was sitting until all of his enemies are made a, a footstool, right? Well, now is the time for Jesus to stand, which implies action. Think of it this way. When a king sits on his throne, he may have ambassadors and delegates come in and he might send them on a mission to deliver a message, to carry a letter, to go to war. Well, didn't Jesus send his disciples to go out and call the children of Israel into the kingdom, but they would not listen? And then what does Jesus say when no one's coming to the, the wedding feast? What does he do? He sends them out. And he says, go into the, the highways and the streets and the marketplaces and call in anyone you see. That's the Gentiles. This is all part of the plan. He is sending out his delegations, but when the king stands up off of his throne, he's not sending delegates. He's not sending ambassadors. He is standing to judge and take action. One way we know this, even though there are many scriptures we could go to, I'm going to go to one in Isaiah chapter 3, starting in verse 8. For Jerusalem stumbled, and Judah is fallen, because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord, to provoke the eyes of his glory. The look on their countenance witnesses against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom. They do not hide it. Woe to their soul, for they have brought evil upon themselves. Say to the righteous that it shall be well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Woe to the wicked, it shall be ill with him. For the reward of his hand shall be given him. As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O oh, my people, those who lead you cause you to err, and destroy the way of your paths. The Lord stands up to plead. Now get this. The Lord stands up to plead, and stands to judge the people. The Lord will enter into judgment with the elders of his people and his princes, for you have eaten up the vineyard. The plunder of the poor is in your houses. What do you mean by crushing my people and grinding the faces of the poor, says the Lord God of hosts. The Lord standing here is not only to plead, but to enter into judgment against his people. Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father is standing because he's about to judge that nation. And he told them that this would happen. He warned them in the Olivet Discourse and all throughout his earthly ministry. He warned them through prophets like Daniel that after the coming of Messiah, the end would come with a flood, the prophecy against Jerusalem and the temple. And I know... I'm mentioning so much about eschatology, and I'm not trying to confuse anybody or rub anybody the wrong way. I plan to start doing some videos in Daniel here soon, but I'm just trying to draw your minds to be challenged through this. Now, with such a, a silly comment that could be made about 
you know, Stephen receiving a standing ovation or God going with plan B. It seems so silly, but there's so much weight even in this one passage. Jesus standing up implies judgment is coming, which is the very reason they cried with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord, and they cast him out of the city and stoned him. Now, I want you to hear those words. They cast him out of the city. Prior to this, Stephen had quoted from Isaiah 66. Let's see. He goes from verse 1 of Isaiah 66. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build for me? And where is the place to my rest? For all those things my hand has made and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look. On him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. Now, Jesus mentioned this. If you read the, the Gospel of Luke, goes perfectly with Acts. Um, of course, because it was written by the same author. But in Acts, you see this so many times that the kingdom of heaven is compared uh, in ways that draw you to the conclusion. Be humble. Be of a contrite spirit. Tremble at the word of the Lord. Receive his word. Believe in him. Continuing on in Isaiah 66. He who kills a bull is as if he slays a man. He who sacrifices a lamb as if he breaks a dog's neck. He who offers a grain offering as if he offers swine's blood. He who burns incense as if he blesses an idol. Just as they have chosen their own ways and their soul delights in their abominations, so will I choose their delusions and bring their fears on them. Because when I called, no one answered. When I spoke, they did not hear. But they did evil before my eyes and chose that in which I do not delight. Now here's where I want you to focus. Uh, going back to Acts chapter 7. That the people ran at him, grabbed him, threw him out of the city. They cast him out of the city. Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word. Your brethren who hated you, who cast you out for my name's sake, said, Let the Lord be glorified that we may see your joy, but they shall be ashamed. The sound of noise from the city, a voice from the temple, the voice of the Lord who fully repays his enemies. See, there's no coincidence in why he's quoting Isaiah 66. He's speaking of the impending destruction of the temple in Jerusalem that Jesus warned them about and they would not listen they hardened their hearts they kept to the things that they valued and not the things that pleased God and instead of hearing his message and the fact that he was telling them the king is standing at the right hand of the father he is he has stood up from his throne and he is coming to judge you Stephen's essentially calling them to repent because he says, the Lord says, on this one will I look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word, but they would not hear him. Instead, they grabbed Stephen, and as it said in Isaiah 66, your brethren who hated you, who cast you out for my name's sake, said, let the Lord be glorified that we may see your joy, but the end Result, those very people will be ashamed because the voice from the temple, the voice of the Lord, who fully repays his enemies, his promises are coming. The promises from as far back in the Old Testament as the law of Moses spoken to the people who would inevitably rebel against their God. And he promises them, you who do not receive my word, it will be required of you. This implies judgment. No, Jesus did not stand to give Stephen a standing ov ovation. He did not stand because, well, maybe Israel will accept me and then sat back down because they didn't. No, he stood because the promises of God are true and you better believe it. Jesus came in judgment 
on Jerusalem, the temple, and apostate Israel. I know that this was a long video and a lot of information. I hope I made sense in the case that I built. I do not expect everyone to agree with the conclusions I came to, but I hope you see how much scripture I am trying to go to to draw a conclusion on this text by using the scripture to support it. Instead of coming up with silly arguments with no scriptural foundation whatsoever, you will not find any justifiable reason to think that Stephen got a standing ovation or that God's plan had failed. But with what I've presented, there is scripture upon scripture upon scripture that supports my view. I hope this makes sense to you. I hope it will challenge you and get you to think. Contemplate these scriptures and, and the case that I have made. I pray that it challenges you and opens your eyes to some of the bad teaching that is out there because it really is bad. Anyways, I hope you all liked this, this message today. If you did, please like, share, and subscribe and join us on Facebook. Again, facebook.com slash as it is written lessons. And until next time, God bless. And please continue to study the word of God. Question everything. The scriptures tell us, test the spirits. Question so that you can know what God is truly trying to tell you. All right. God bless.